Let me take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Matthew again. Matthew chapter 6. Continuing our study on the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, this morning kind of feels like a, a homecoming, doesn't it? And, uh, is Zion okay? Zion's fine. Praise God. Okay. Uh, we are looking, by the way, I, I, look at the, I look at the clock and I told Teresa, I'm not going to have, uh, I don't look like I'm going to have my time this morning. And she said, you know what her response was? Don't worry. <laughs> you hate that when they throw it right back at you? So, <laughs> we, we are studying the, this sermon of Jesus, the sermon that that he wanted his followers to hear, I believe. The sermon that demonstrates and, and, and shows us the kingdom that he intended to establish, first of all, in the hearts of his children, in the hearts of his disciples. We who are followers of Jesus Christ to be changed from the inside out. And then that change that takes place as the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives is supposed to, 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 to again, I don't know a better word, but it's just kind of supposed to ooze out of us. In the, in the sense that we live so much in the kingdom of God that the way we live touches the world that God has put us in. We are to be, as he said earlier in this sermon, the salt and the light. We are to make a difference where God has put us. How can we make a difference lest, first of all, we have Christ within us, and then secondly, have his teachings brought to us by his Holy Spirit that we might know the heart of our God and our Savior so that we might respond to him and walk as the people he's called us to be. This morning we look at Christ's cure for worry. How many of you ever worry? Okay, the next question for those of you who raise your hand, how many of you are liars? Okay. Well, you know, uh, we are, it, it's, a, it's a universal thing that we deal with this matter of worry. But Jesus has a message for us as his people. Do we believe this morning in this church that our God is not only an awesome God, but our God is a sovereign God. How many you believe that God is a sovereign God? Amen. Amen? How many of you know that God knows the end from the beginning? Amen. How many of you know, as the prophet tells us, that, that before any of us ever were, he already knew the number of our days. Amen. And he already knew what we would have to face. You do not exist at this time in human history by, by accident. You are part of God's providential plan. And he intends to speak in your life and work through your life. You are his child. He knew you before you were born. He knew you would be his before you were ever his. And he knew you would be here this morning. And he knew also everything, every event, every happening that will, that's going to happen in your life. Now some of those things, because of the way life is, some of those things are good, aren't they? Some of those things are wonderful. We just sit back and say, Praise you, Jesus. Thank you for all these good things that are happening in our life. Thank you for blessing me. But truth be told, many times the things that we deal with in life are not so good. Some of those things are very hard for us to deal with, hard for us to handle. And we wonder what's going to happen next, and we actually worry about what we're going to have to go through. Now, you've already testified, you believe we have a sovereign God who knows the end from the beginning. You've already said that God knows the days that, you, that you have, he has appointed for you here on earth. You know he has your life in his hands. But one more thing, he also holds eternity in his hand. And he has promised to those who believe in him eternity. Amen? Amen. He has promised everlasting life to those who respond to his Holy Spirit and come to faith in Jesus Christ. So, from that place, let's hear the words of our Savior. Matthew chapter 6, starting verse 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? <laughs> Rhetorical question. Of course it is. We go on, verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither snow, uh, sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more... Or, excuse me, are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the, of the field, how they grow. 
They either toil or spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek, and that word Gentile there speaks of unbeliever, all these things the unbelievers seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now that wonderful verse, verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what we have experienced even this morning. What a wonderful thing for the body of Christ to gather together. Father, we've been privileged to, to be reminded of, particularly of two of your men that, that love you and served you through the years. Thank you for it. That's an encouragement to us. And we also gather here rejoicing that they have entered into their reward. Now, Lord, we need to hear from your Holy Spirit this morning. So many people in this room are going through so many different things. And, Lord, you have the cure for that which ails us. So, Lord, help us to be a people who do not worry about tomorrow, but who trust you today, tomorrow, and into eternity. Thank you for the assurance we have of our faith and our, our salvation in Jesus Christ. Thank you for the promise of eternity. Thank you for the promise of your presence as we gather here. And then as we go out into the world, you promise you'll be with us. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for speaking to our hearts. Teach us now. Give us hearts that are receptive. In Jesus' name, amen. Worry. What is worry? It's interesting. There's a lot of definitions of worry. But what it, what it is not, let me just say this first of all, worry is not concern. We are to be concerned. Worry is not caring. That, that caring is not what worry means. We are to care. We are to have empathy. We are to uh, be responsive to, to hard things and, 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 and troubled times that go on in people's lives. We are to, we are to under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, uh, I think we are to, 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 be, to make plans to make sure uh, the best we can under his leadership, we can be responsive to what's going to happen in life. What is worry then? Well, you may not be able to define it completely, but you certainly know it when you feel it, don't you? You know it when you're, you're in the midst of it. The word that we translate worry is based in this, in this text on a Greek word, which actually means, now listen, it means to be divided. It means, it means to be pulled in different directions. Now think about that. In, when we're focusing on Jesus Christ, when we're looking to Jesus, as the writer of Hebrews says, the author and the finisher of our faith, we understand he is the author, the originator, and he is the finisher, that is, the completer of our faith. When we keep our eyes focused on him, then we're not pulled in a hundred different directions, we're not pulled in two directions, we keep our eyes upon him. Worry means to be divided, to be pulled in two different directions. The word that we use in English, worry, comes, it, it, has a, it actually has a German root, which means... I like this. It means to choke or to strangle. What does worry do to us when we're consumed by it? It incapacitates us. It makes us feel anxiety. It, 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 it takes control of our very being. We're, we, we, we actually, in our worry at times, take ourselves completely out of the, out of the game. We're, we're, we're not able to be used by God because we're consumed by a worry, and it makes us choke, it makes us strangle, it makes it hard to breathe. That's what the word worry means. But Jesus tells us in this passage that we need to recognize that if we are going to be a people who follow the way of the world, and notice he, he talked about the Gentiles, we follow the way of the world, that we have made a decision to be disobedient to our Savior. Now, sometimes we think about, we don't think about worry in the, in, in, in the, the framework of it possibly being disobedience to God, of it possibly being uh, actually a sin. If you define sin as anything that's contrary to God's will for your life, then certainly worry would fall into that category, would it not? If Jesus says, do not worry, and we worry, then are we not being disobedient to him? 
Are we not at least being a people that lack faith or trust in him to be who he needs to be and who he will be in every situation and every circumstance of life? It's important for us when we consider what the Bible talks about worry, that we recognize that when we decide to step from a place of faith and trust and reliance upon God, single-mindedness toward God, and step into the place of worry, we are dividing our allegiances. And we are bringing trouble into our own life. We're bringing trouble into our life, considering those things, listen to me, considering those things we can't do anything about. Now, does it make any sense to worry about things that we cannot do anything about? It doesn't make sense at all. All it does, all it will do, is affect who we are and affect our ability to hear from God and our, effect, our ability to respond to God and walk in the power of God and see Him do tremendous and, and wonderful things in our life that we could never do on our own. But when worry consumes us, that's not a possibility. Three times in this passage, Jesus commands us not to worry. Look at verse 25. He says, therefore I say to you, do not worry. Look at verse 31. He says, therefore do not worry. Look once again in verse 34. Therefore, do not worry. Three times. Therefore, do not worry. You think he wants us to know something? You know, it's one thing when he says one time, don't do something. But here in this passage, he says three times. And every time he does it, you notice it begins with that word, therefore. That means in between telling us not to worry, in between his command not to worry, he gives us great reason why we shouldn't worry. And the greatest reason that we should not worry is because, listen, he is God. He's God. And because he's God, listen, he's able. He's able. Now what we like to attach to him is his performance rather than attach or, or understand him for who he is. And what I mean by that is, if we would say something like this, you know, if God would take care of my situation, I wouldn't worry about it. So, so often what we treat God is, as, as he exists, God exists just to, just to make everything right in my life. The next question would be, who's the one who determines what, what's right in your life? I, I would say we're a little bit biased on that, wouldn't you? When I'm determining what's good for me, what's right for me, what I want, I will always be biased. I would like this, I would like that, I would like this other thing. So, God, if you are able, I will have faith in you, and I will not worry, God, if you will do such and such. That type of relationship or that type of understanding with God, let me tell you something, needs no faith at all. Because that type of approach to God waits upon God to do what you want him to do, and once he does it, then you say, oh, then, Lord, I'll be responsive to you. Biblical faith is when I cannot see with my eyes and when I cannot completely understand with my mind what is going on. Still, yet still, I trust in God. When everything doesn't go as I thought it should go, when, 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 when the report is not as good as I thought it should have been, and when I, when, I, when I don't get all the things that I thought I should have gotten, when I, I don't get all these things. Still, Lord, you are God. Still, Lord, I trust you. Trista sang a wonderful song, didn't she? You can take all this world. You can take the whole world if I can have Jesus. Do you believe that? Yes. You can take everything I have if I can have Jesus. You can, you can take my health. You can take everything I have. As long as I have Jesus, I'm going to be okay. The things of this world are temporal. They last for just a moment, and then they're gone. But the things we have in God through his son, Jesus Christ, are eternal. And when we grasp that, then we can grasp why our Savior would say, therefore, do not worry. I like how the psalmist puts it. He talks about the anger of God. He talks about, he talks about the, the difficulties of this life. And then he has this wonderful phrase. He says this. He says, he says hold on, my child, for joy comes in the morning. You know what you're destined for? You're destined for an eternity in the presence of Almighty God. This world's hard at times. It is cruel at times. 
that godliness just seems to reign and rule in the, in the land in which we live. But here, you know what you're destined for? You're destined for an eternity in the presence of a holy and a righteous God. A place that he has prepared for you with his own hand. And the day will come when he will come and he will welcome you home. That's what you're destined for. There is no reason to be consumed with worry when you know that you're a child of God. And you know that he has everything in his hand. And, he, and you know that he has, he has prepared eternity for you. What a great God that we have. Therefore, do not worry is what Jesus says. He says it three times. But Jesus warns us as human beings about the two things that we have a tendency to worry about. Look, look at verse, verse 25 and 31. He says, he says, after he says do not worry, he goes on to say, uh, don't worry about what you're gonna what you're gonna eat or what you're gonna drink, nor what your body and what you're gonna put on. Because isn't the body more than clothing? And then look with me at verse uh, 31. He says, once again, therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? Jesus warns us not to fall in the, into that trap of worrying about our phys the physical necessities of life. Sometimes we have bought into the philosophy or the spirit of the age that, that we exist to acquire things. We exist to, to, to get things for ourselves, whether it be uh, food or, or clothing. Now, of course, we need those things. By the way, the Bible says God knows you need those things. But we ought not to be consumed with, with doing everything we can just to get those things. That's not why we are. You are more than money, possession, food, and clothing. You are more than that. And your life means more than that because all of those things, once again, are temporary. They have their place. I understand that. We need those things. We need to be nourished. We need to be clothed. We need to have a place to live. But we don't exist for those things. And when you get it in your mind that you exist for material things, understand this, when you get in your mind that you exist for material things, and you're, the reason you are is to acquire those things, or earn those things, or that's, the, that's what your life is all about, those things begin to become your master. Remember earlier when he said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. It's not a denial of the need of those things, it is a it is putting those things in their proper place in the life of a believer and understanding God is a provider of everything that we have. The second thing that Jesus warns us about in this area of worry, look at verse 34. And he says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. See, we worry about physical necessities. We do that all the time. But then we also worry about tomorrow. What's tomorrow going to bring? What's tomorrow going to be like? How much longer am I going to be here? Now, I'm on the downhill side right now, guys. <laughs> Don't laugh. Most of you are, too. <laughs> okay? So, I don't know. You know, we say that, but whether we're talking about someone very young or someone very... We don't know how many days God has appointed for them. But certainly most of us in this room right now are closer to the end than we were when we started, right? <laughs> Makes sense, doesn't it? Doesn't it make sense not to spend all your time... If you spend all your time consumed with worry about what's going to happen tomorrow, then, then you're going to miss tomorrow. I do weddings. Did you know that? I do weddings. <laughs> One of the things I like to say, to the, particularly to the bride at a wedding, the groom, most of the time the groom, he's just kind of spaced out. Whatever she wants. <laughs> but it's the bride who, who, I can see in her face, it starts in the counseling time. She said, she's trying to figure all these things out. Is he going to respond? Is he going to say the wrong thing to the pastor and I have to apologize for him and all this kind of stuff? You know? And then we get to, we get to the day. And, and I try to tell the young bride, I say, listen, I don't want you to miss your own way. And I've seen it happen. I've seen brides so consumed with worry about thinking everything's going to happen, everything's going to run smoothly, if they're going to look good, she's going to look good, or, or if, you know, hopefully none of the attendants are going to act like fools, all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and so consumed with worry that before she knows it, the day's over, her wedding is over, and she doesn't remember a thing about it. So I think part of the thing that God has me to do is, is try to, listen, stop, 
enjoy. When we get to that day, that's your day. You don't worry about anything else. Let's take care of all that before we get there. Then you can enjoy your day. See, I think that's what Jesus wants to say to his bride. So often, we're just like brides that are, that are so consumed with worrying about this and worrying about that and worrying about how things are going to turn out tomorrow and, 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 and what's going to happen in, in, ahead that we miss today. Many years ago, I was privileged to go to a, a seminar that was taught by Henry and Richard Blackaby. Just a wonderful time, wonderful men of God. And they sat there and they talked, and it was a seminar for pastors of medium to small churches is what it was. Describe that. And, and, and one of the things that Richard Blackaby said to the group of men, she said, he said, guys, so many of you are worried about where you're heading. You're worried about where you're heading. And some of you think you're heading to this big, large church with thousands of people to follow you and everybody to, you know, kind of basically fall at your knees and tell you how wonderful you are and stuff like that. You, you're always looking ahead, guys, to where you're going to go. Like there's greener pastures somewhere else. And you're worried about how you're going to get there and how you're going to... Uh, how are you going to make yourself appealing so you can get there and stuff? And he says, the problem with that, guys, is you're missing something. You think you exist to be going somewhere. And listen, church, I think many Christians, is that we, we exist just to be going somewhere. But he said to him, he said, listen, guys, where you're going is not the gift. The journey is the gift. The gift of God is today. That's what Jesus is trying to say. The gift of God is today. Don't miss today worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow. The Lord wants you to rest in Him today. God wants you to experience Him today. Because there's no guarantee that you'll be experiencing Him tomorrow the same way you do today. So in these two areas, Jesus gives us warnings about, about worrying. Don't worry about your physical needs. Don't worry about, about uh, material things. And then don't worry about tomorrow. God has tomorrow in His hand. Trust and be God, not only of today, but trust and be God of tomorrow. The second thing I want to share with you this morning is that we need to understand the reason why we should not worry. Why would Jesus say don't worry? In other words, what are the effects of worry, according to Jesus, uh, in the life of a believer? Look with me at verse 34, the last part. Here's what he said. He said, su he said uh, sufficient for today is its own trouble. Well, that's an interesting thought. Anybody ever felt that way? Boy, today's a mess. I don't want to mess with my mark. <laughs> sufficient for today is its own trouble. What is Jesus warning, of, warning us about? He's warning us that, that our worry adds trouble to our lives today. Today's hard enough sometimes, right? So why do we want to go borrow trouble for that which we have no control over, and we don't even know if it's going to happen anyway? That's what Jesus is saying. So walk in him today. Trust him today. He warns us not to worry, and he says, because when we worry, we add trouble to our lives. We're the ones... It's not the situation that's adding trouble. It's not even what's going to happen tomorrow that's adding trouble. It's we who are adding trouble to our own life. And we, we incapacitate ourselves today from being usable in God's purpose. I know there's a lot of things we wonder about for tomorrow. I wonder about tomorrow. I wonder what's going to happen, you know? But, but we cannot be consumed by those things because it will, it will, if you can put it this way, it will take us out of the game today. The second thing that, that he, need, he wants us to... Uh, be concerned about look at 25 see the last part of 25 it, he says is not life more than food and the body more than clothing Jesus says when we worry we have misplaced priorities again he's not denying the need for food or clothing but he said he makes this great statement is not life more than these things well what a terrible lie we bought into if we think that that's what life's about if we think that we exist to do those things to make those things Jesus wants us to know that worry for these things, it, it makes our priorities change. It moves our priorities. Instead of having our priorities on the kingdom of God, instead of having our priorities on the things of God, we have priorities on the things that are not going to be here tomorrow. Why else does he tell us we ought not to worry? Look with me at verse 30. And that's what he says. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is today... And tomorrow is thrown into the oven. Will he not want much more clothe you? And then we don't like this last part, but it, 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 it's Jesus speaking to us, and we have to hear it. Oh, you of little faith. He tells us that we ought not to worry because worry indicates or is an indicator that we are actually people of little faith. 
Now let me give you my definition for faith. You've been with me on Wednesday night, you know what this is. Faith, very simply, is this. Our response to God's initiative. Our response to God's initiative. Well, that means that God is always the first mover in our life. That, that means that God is always active in our life. And God is always pouring himself into our life, into our circumstances, in, in, into, into our past. Okay? Now, faith is, you and I, how we respond to God. Not to the situation, not to the circumstance, not to our feelings, but to God, who is God in the midst of those things. And Jesus said, when we worry, what we're saying to God is, listen, we're saying to God, God, you can't really handle this. Or, maybe something that's even worse, we're saying, I, I really think sometimes what we do is, as, as individual Christians is we want to say, God, God, let me handle this. So we actually want to move God out of the out of the out of the out of the picture and say, God, I can take on this. You know, you know what life does every time we do something like that. Well, you're going to be you're going to be laid out. Life is going to smack you and knock you down. I guarantee you. There's never a time, there's never a place in the life of a Christian that we ought not to be completely, 100, percent totally reliant upon God. How often do I need God? I always need God. You mean every minute? I mean every second. I mean every nanosecond. I need God. I can do this on my own. No, you can't. Just try it. See how messed up you will be and the situation will become. Jesus tells us here that when we worry, when, we, when we're consumed by worry, what we're, we're, we're actually not living by faith. And by the way, elsewhere in the scripture, here's what it says. That which is not of faith, listen to me, is sin. See, we always want this long list of sins. And there, there's a list there. You can find them if you want to. But we don't want to cut it this fine. But, but the scripture does cut it this fine. He says, that which is not of faith is sin in the life of a believer. The point is, there's never a time that we ought not to be walking in faith. Responding to God as God works his truth and his, and his purpose out in our life. Well, the fourth thing that we need, we, he gives us a reason why we ought not to worry. Look at verse 27. Here's what he said. Which of you can, by worrying, can add one cubit to its stature? Now, I'm going to paraphrase this, and here's what it is. Worrying is useless. It does nothing. Worrying is a waste of time. Because worrying never did anything to make the situation better, no matter what the situation was. All it ever does, once again, is incapacitates us from being open to the work of God in our life. I'm so consumed with worry, I can't hear the voice of God. I'm so consumed with worry, I cannot trust the leadership of God in my life. And I, and I find myself consumed with worrying about things that I cannot do anything about. You could wish that you were taller. You can wish all day long and, and nothing's going to happen. You can wish you were this. You can wish you were that. You can wish that something was going to happen. You can worry that this would be or that would be. But that's not going to change anything. And even in the midst of, of people going through very hard times, we must be very careful that we don't, be, we don't become consumed by worry, but walk in compassion and empathy and caring and loving one another in the midst of what someone is going through. But not stepping in that place of worry because worry won't change that. Worry will just make it worse. But caring and compassion and empathy, you may raise a brother or sister up even in the midst of trials and trouble. You might be the voice of God in their life and you might be the heart of the Holy Spirit in their life that shows, that shows them that God still loves them and that God still cares even in the midst of what they're going through. That's not driven by worry. That's driven by faith. Responding to God as he moves in your heart and wants to touch someone's life. So Jesus gives us a command not to worry and he tells us that if, that if we do, if we are consumed by worry, we're being disobedient to him. He gives us reasons why we ought not to worry because there's no benefit. Basically, there's no benefit in worrying at all. It changes nothing except harming us. Well, let's close this out this morning. And I want to say one other thing to you. That God has a cure for worry. And I could be very concise, but that's not me. And say that Jesus is the cure for worry. And that's true. 
Jesus is the cure for worry. But I'm going to be very careful that we don't, as I say so many times, that we don't put, turn this into a bumper sticker. We put it on the back of our car and say, well, don't worry, just trust Jesus. Or Jesus is a, is a cure for worry. That's not, our faith was never meant to be put in little slogans slammed around so people can be challenged as to whether or not they have the right kind of faith. <coughs> we're to walk it. We're to live it. We're to be it. So the transforming, this transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our life, God might use that to touch someone else's life. And the Holy Spirit might use that to touch someone else's heart <laughs> and bring them into a place where they put their trust and their faith in Jesus Christ. We as a church, this is kingdom truth here, we need to apply the Lord's cure for worry in our life. What is that? Look at verse 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barn, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. I love this last part. Are you not more of value than they? Are you? Do you understand that as a human being, you are a special creation of God? That special creation of God sets you apart from the angelic beings and sets you apart from the, from the animal kingdom. You are not an animal. So don't act like one. Oh, yeah. Okay? You are not an animal. You are not like a monkey. You are not like a dog. You are not like a fish. You, and you never were those things. You are a special creation of God. Do you understand as a human being, you're the only one in all the scriptures that's described this way, that he created man in his own image. Special creation of God. Now he created us that we might have a relationship and fellowship with him, that we might know God in a way that no other being, heavenly or earthly, could know God. That's humanity. That's how God created That's why he created us. You are important to God. Why? Because God created you. Why? Because God loves you. Why? Because God cares for you. When he sees you, he sees a precious soul that he created, and he cares about what's going on in your life. He cares what you're going through, and he's going to be there for you. He promises he'll be there for you. And in this passage, Jesus reminds us that we as a people... The cure that he has for us in our worry is that we need to trust in the Lord's provision. Here, Jesus uses an analogy in his teaching. He talks about good earthly fathers. And he says something like this. He says, you who are good earthly fathers, if your child came to you and asked you for a piece of bread, how many would give him a stone? No, what you would give them is you would give them a piece of bread. And you might, because you're a good earthly father, you might not just give them a piece of bread, but you might put some jam on that bread too. <laughs> and he said, if you know how to do that as earthly men, how much more does your heavenly father, your righteous, loving, gracious, merciful heavenly father know to give you that which is good? God, help me to trust your provision. Not just with what I see, not just with what I can feel, not just with what I can put in my bank account or, or put in, my, in, 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 the, in the pantry shelves at my home, but Lord, help me to trust your provision no matter what. You do understand, and we talk about this a lot of times, we have Christian brothers and sisters that they, when, when they talk about trusting God for his provision, they're talking about their next breath. They're not worried about whether their car's running properly. They're not worried about if they have a leak on the roof. They're not worried about, you know, if their pantry is completely full. They're not worried about those things. What they're concerned about is, will I live another day? Will my kids live another day? Or will the enemy raise up his armies? And will they come in and destroy me and my family? Perspective is a wonderful thing when we can get it. Sometimes it's hard for we Westerners to get it because we don't experience that thing. But we do need to have proper perspective. We think if, if everything is not full and everything's not running smoothly and everything's not repaired and everything's not gloriously wonderful to look at and, and <coughs> wonderful to touch and stuff like that, that somehow God is not providing. We are such a jaded people. And our view of the world is not what most people say. Now that's where we are, and that's okay. 
as long as the worry for those things do not consume us. And we understand that Jesus has called us to trust God for our provision. <coughs> That's security. You're hurting today? Trust God for your provision. You wonder what tomorrow's going to hold? Trust God for your provision. You wonder what you're going to do next? Trust God for your provision. It's not just words. It is life itself. And finally, look at verse 33. Again, that wonderful verse. For Jesus actually, actually tells us the cure. I love this cure for worry. He says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what's he say? And all these other things shall be added unto you. Isn't it an interesting thing that in almost everything in life, when we stop looking at self, when we stop being consumed with what we're personally going through, when we stop worrying about where we are, when we stop just hurting for ourselves, and we start looking outside of ourselves, somehow the issues of our own personal issues seem to sort of fade. Do they not? And this is the wonderful eternal truth that in Christ Jesus, when we seek him and we seek his kingdom, that's then the promise of God is that his provision will flow into our life. It will be there. Now, Pastor, are you saying it's going to be there to the extent that, that I want it to be there? Well, I don't know how you want it to be there. Because unfortunately, we Westerners many times are very selfish people. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Here's what I want you to understand. Our all-knowing, all-powerful, all sovereign Father who's in heaven knows what I need. He knows what you need. And I believe he's actively involved in our lives to bring us what we need. Not always what we want, because so often our wants are out there. And our wants are very selfish. Can I say, as Chris is saying just a little while ago, Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. No matter what life holds, give me Jesus. No matter what the report is, give me Jesus. No matter what my bank account looks like, what my material things look like, give me Jesus. I am God's child. I have been redeemed by his son, Jesus Christ. And I want to spend the rest of my day, day experiencing Jesus, no matter what the world has to our Savior wants you and I, as his children, as his disciples, as kingdom people, to stop being consumed by worry and to trust him with everything. Listen, because he's able. And I don't believe he's just able. I believe he wants to do that in your life. Whatever you need, he's not only able, but he wants to do it in your life. I ask you to bow your head with me this morning. With your head bowed and your eyes closed, can I ask you this? And just, just a question I have that I would like for you to consider letting the Holy Spirit speak to your heart about. How much of your time is consumed by worrying about things? Whatever those things may be. How much does worry drive your life? And how much does this worry, how, how has it changed your perspective of what's important in life? And changed your priorities in life? Today would be a good day to give it to Jesus. Now there may be some who are here this morning that don't know Jesus yet. And it's not easy. You can't give it to Jesus unless first of all you know him. But I believe God wants you to know him. I believe the Holy Spirit is speaking in the hearts of people right now. I want you to trust Jesus Christ for who he is and what he's done. He is the son of God and he died for your sins. He paid the price for your sins. And once he was dead, they buried him and three days later he rose from the dead overcoming sin and death and hell. And what does he require of you? Put your faith and your trust in him. And if you have never done that but would like to, you feel led to do that this morning, myself and some other men will be here in front be glad to pray with you about that. But as always, when I look around this church, I see mostly professing Christians, those who know Jesus Christ. <clears throat> what does your faith look like, my Christian brothers and sisters? How much does worry control the way you live, the way you respond to life? Wouldn't it be a good day to 
just turn it over to him. I mean genuinely give it to him. <coughs> Walk in response to him. Not by situation, not by circumstance, not by what our eyes see or our hands feel or our ears hear, but by the promise of an eternal God who loves you completely and has promised to be your provision. Once I'm going to pray with you about the concern you have or, or, or the struggle you're having, be glad to do that. The steps are open right here. Go grab someone's hand and say, come pray with me, brother or sister. Finally, if God brought you here and he wants you part of this church family, you come. We'll welcome you with open arms. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the promise that through the singing and through the praise, through the, through the prayers, through the giving, and then through your word, you have promised to be here. You promised to feed and provide us with your eternal truth. Thank you for that. Now, Lord, we pray, or I pray, that we would be a people that would respond to you right now. That we would act in faith. As you've spoken to our hearts, as you've led us, as you've brought us to this place that we'd be responsive to you right now in this place. In Jesus' name I pray.